Hello and a warm welcome to you all here today uh, with a thankful acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the land on which we sit, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Writer and photographer Michael Katakis is the author of a number of books including Dispatches, The Vietnam Veterans Memorial, Photographs and Words with Dr Chris Harden, Traveller, Observations from an American in Exile, and most recently, A Thousand Shards of Glass, There is Another America. His writing and photography have been collected by museums and galleries all over the world, including the British Library in London, which is now the rep repository of his entire photographic work, and for which he is the ambassador. Michael Katakis is also a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, where in 2001 his and Dr Chris Harden's exhibition, A Time and a Place Before War, opened at the Geographical Society in London. Now, Monty Python's Michael Palin, uh, actor, writer and traveller, has this to say of Michael Katakis in the Ford to Traveller. Whether on the dusty roads of Sierra Leone, in a cafe on the Bosphorus, in a Chinese village without a map, in Dallas, Texas, or on the Paris metro, he makes a place for us beside him. And thank you so much for making a place for us to oh, beside you today, Michael. Thank you very much. It's, it's lovely very nice to have to be you. here. Thank, thank you. you. Now, around 15 years ago, you were chosen by Patrick Hemingway, who's mm -hmm. Ernest Hemingway's son, as the overseer of the Hemingway Literary Estate. Can you tell us how this came about? Sure. Uh, Patrick, I was working on a book. Uh, I had an idea for a book, a collection of essays by varied authors called Sacred Trusts about stewardship and about the environment. And I thought that Patrick Hemingway, who had been a, a white hunter and guide in Tanzania for many years, would have something very interesting to write. So he agreed, uh, as did the other writers. And uh, everything was put together. Everything was there for the publisher. I leave for Sierra Leone. I come back, and a publisher, an editor at the publishing house, had gone a bit mad and had uh, become very politically correct while I was gone and changed things like timbermen to timber people. And you could see where the authors were in a rage. And so anyway, I resolved the issue uh, with the publisher, and Patrick called and said, Michael, I really love the way you handled that. He said, are you a fly fisherman? And I said, well, since I was a little boy, yes. He said, why don't you come to Montana and, and fish and we'll talk and visit. And so I did. And we were fishing on the Missouri River. And he said to me, you know, we've been looking for someone to handle my father's estate. And you did very good. I've been handling it for a long time, but we need some young blood. <laughs> and I said, well, that's really good. I said, you should find someone from in the family. And he said, my family's crazy. And I said, I, I said, well, everybody's family is crazy. <laughs> so, uh, and, and so I said, that's really not my racket, Pat, but God, I'm really, that's a compliment. Thank you. So then that evening, he started serving me paddlefish caviar that he had made. He caught the paddlefish, made the caviar with vodka and then we had brandy and we had some wine and all that. And then I think we had more drinks and, and, and then I wake up in the morning with a slight headache and my wife says, nice going, bucko. Um, you said you would help Pat. And I said, I did not. She said, I was there. Yes, you did. And that's uh, how it began and that was a wonderful beginning and I started getting boxes and boxes of material, many of it in Ernest Hemingway's own hand of contracts that went back to 1930. Uh, and, and so so began the ride under the understanding, with the understanding that Patrick and I agreed to that I could leave at any time and that if it interfered with my writing and my work at any time. And so far it's been a lovely relationship and Pat is like my uncle, you know, mm. he's, it's wonderful. So we've managed to make it work. Has it taken you to places that you wouldn't have expected to go? Well, no, I, I've been traveling extensively uh, for a long time, and I would have been anyway, but the people that I've met as a result of the Hemingway work and having to iron out things when I'm in different parts of the world mm. have been wonderful, like Fernando Pivano in <coughs> Milan, who, who introduced Hemingway there and did some translations. Uh, people who knew Ernest Hemingway, though I've been with Patrick for so many years now that I've heard so many stories about 
firsthand stories about Ernest Hemingway that I, I won't say that I know him, but I have a sense of him very well. And then meeting other people around the world uh, who knew him, uh, that's been fun. Mm. That's been fun because they have always been people of words and books who met him, even if it's a, um, a little fisherman uh, who knew him in Cuba or it's this person or that person. Um, it's always been tied to the books in some way. You know? Having a, a sense of Hemingway, has that influenced your words and your work? Uh, no, uh, no, I, I, I must say no. Mm -hmm. uh, look, you know, everyone parrots or character, uh, does a caricature of Hemingway. We could do one right here. <laughs> um, we could, ah, I loved Spain where the beer was cold and the women were kind. <laughs> Hemingway? <laughs> you know, <laughs> see? Um, uh, so I think in terms of brevity of text, yes, he's helped me to become uh, more precise and more quickly, seeing that I write nonfiction most of the time. Mm -hmm. But I've taken those literary uh, traits and tried to apply them to nonfiction. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, he gave some great advice uh, to writers. Uh, first was, Write what you know, start with a true declarative sentence, and then just when you know what's going to happen next, stop writing so that you're fresh the next day and you don't face the page wondering where you're going to go. You already remember that sentence and you proceed, which is great advice, mm. I found. I hope you're all writing that down. Mm. <laughs> now, you write in Traveller, um, I'll quote you here, Ernest Hemingway once said that every time he saw words, it was as if he was seeing them for the first time. And for me, every time I walk ancient streets or board a train or ship or plane, the feeling too is like the first time. Mm. Is, is that why you travel? It is. It's almost like every time the bag that sits not far from my easy chair next to the fireplace, next to the books, mm. Every time I lift it up, it's another new adventure where I'm going to get to hear other people's stories, understand how they live, perhaps return with a modicum, just, just a touch of wisdom uh, and understanding and empathy, and to also become something that I was not before I walked out the door. So for me, it's so exciting every time it happens. Even in my advanced years, uh, it's still as exciting as it was when I was 17 years old when I left home. Mm, mm. So in that way, I, I suppose it's kind of Huck Finn. I've never quite grown up a little <laughs> bit, and um, I've never been cured of wanderlust, thank goodness. So. Mm. And, yet, and yet you seem to, to gather and, and to record extensively. Yes. Um, are you a great journaler? I am. Mm. I, I keep a journal. I look at the journal the way I look at a camera, as just a sketchbook, uh, so that I'm seeing things. But I've learned that I don't pull out that camera. I rarely do. I'm a person who's a writer who happens to take pictures. Great pictures. But, um, but I'm someone who is more interested in not bringing out these, these tools, mm. because people then aren't themselves. They're usually after the fact. I'm not there like a journalist writing down what people are doing. I'm trying to first live within their life mm -hmm. and be a part of it as, as much as I can be and listen and do much less talking mm. and just participate, but not as a voyeur, mm. not as someone who just sits back and watches. Uh, in, in Traveller, you talk about art that shakes your foundations and preconceptions. Do you, are you seeking this in, in your writing? Are you, are you seeking to reproduce this in, in your writing? Hmm. I think in the writing, I, what I'm trying to do is get to the essence of things which have, since, have, have always eluded me. Uh, and maybe when you get to the essence of things, maybe it's time that you stop, or because it's an illusion that you think you've gotten there. I think I'm always curious about what's around the next corner, how I write down, for instance, 
how do I write down the sorrow of the man in Africa who loses his family because his wife accidentally buys a defoliant instead of a delicer and rubs it into all of their children's hair. Mm. And one by one they die. And just the day before, this man's eyes are bright, the thing on top of his head that he's carrying to his subsistence farm. How do I describe that in words? Mm. Uh, to make the reader not only understand what was lost in his physical family, but what was lost in the spirit of the man. I think I'm always trying mm. to get there. Mm. Uh, and uh, to sh not sympathy, not uh, to pity, but to understand. I think it's very difficult. Mm. And I haven't gotten there yet. That's, that's one of the, the most shocking and touching stories, I think, in, in Traveller. Um, the story of, of going to a village where people have have mistaken the um, the lice treatment for uh, well the, use poison instead, yeah. um, and you uh, you seem to overlay dreams and and sure. and many things. Yes. Um, with that, is that that seems to me a, v a very unusual style of writing in this modern time. Hmm. <laughs> Well, in Traveller was a rather unique book because it was all of these bits and pieces, wasn't it? Bits of journals, bits of dreams, bits of observations. Um, and dreams do, in, uh, do inform us, you know, as uh, they inform how I feel the next morning if the dream was either good or bad. And they, they set a tone for the day, don't they, mm. in, sometimes? Uh, and also, Sometimes they're a respite from the world that we see, that we know. You have to have a dream of also what the world could be. Mm -hmm. So that you're moving along. And to be a good writer, I think you have to, as Hemingway said, see the world as it truly is. Don't romanticize it. But at the same time, we travel down this other road of wishing and hoping of what it could be. And I think only when you have those two roads that you travel, mm -hmm that you have a better picture. If you're one or the other, you tend to fall into either being foolishly optimistic or bizarrely cynical. Mm. And that is not something that is preferable to someone mm. who's trying to write and observe the world, I think. Mm. We were talking uh, backstage a little about um, being liked or, or not liked. And mm -hmm. uh, you said uh, you made a, a statement about the right and the left. Yes. So, so the right. Um, you're hated by the right and hated by the left? Yes, which tells me I'm doing everything properly. <laughs> it means I can talk to both sides and they'll both vilify me. So it's, <laughs> which is good. In A Thousand Shards of Glass, uh, uh, you state that while you're not anti-American, and I'm paraphrasing you here, you have great concerns about the fear and inaction and complic complicity of people in the USA today. And also, um, quoting you, the type of patriot George Orwell once described as the kind of person who is someone, somewhere else when the trigger is pulled. Yeah. Uh, and you also describe yourself as, as an exile. So what does being an exile from all this mean to you? Well, I'm an exile from my country for the simple reason that I'm, I was born in my country. Uh, I wish it well, but I'm not of my country. Almost at every level, I disagree with what my country is doing, how it's behaving. And even when I say country, I'm very, very uncomfortable with the word country. Uh, by every measure that I can measure, and how we behave, and the way we conduct ourselves, America is not a country. It's a store where everything is for sale. Every principle, every ethic, every friend. And uh, you don't expect justice from a store. You don't expect to get health care. Uh, uh, from or justice or fair treatment in that way from a store. You're, a store is a place where you go and buy things. And uh, I have, I, I don't wish to live in a store. Mm. I don't wish to live in a place where ethics are a quaint kind of wording that comes out during political speeches or at certain times. It has to be inculcated into the fabric of a society. It's not inculcated in the fabric of mine. Mm. And that's why when I come to Australia, I'm so envious of you here. You're having difficulties. 
Um, every nation does. But I do get the sense, with all of your difficulties, you're in this together. There's a kind of cohesion um, that's substantive, based upon your public policies, which are possibly under threat now with this government, the privatization schemes and all of this and that. So, but we don't, I don't feel the sense of cohesion and that we're in this together in my country. Mm. So as an exile, how do, you, how do you feel about leaving? Is there a sense of guilt or do you feel that you're able to look at the situation more clearly? Oh, I've been seeing my country very clearly for quite some time. Mm. Uh, do I feel guilt at leaving? No, I've been writing and talking about this for over 25, 27 years. My countrymen, and the problem is my fellow countrymen and women, uh, they don't want to have the conversation. So at a certain point, uh, I'll have the conversation with the world. Uh, I will try to say to them, not what's wrong with America. I will try to say to them, this is perhaps a cautionary tale that you might not wish to follow. And uh, what I'm seeing in different parts of the world is that people are following Americans, and we're not the people to follow right now on a lot of measures. As a matter of fact, I'd like some of the Western countries to be more independent in their thinking and in their behavior, so perhaps they might be able to help us a bit and help us come around. Mm -hmm. uh, we could use that. We could use some of that uh, courtesy and politeness that I've experienced here in Australia and some of the measured discussions that I've had here, even with conservative people here, mm -hmm. I think that uh, my country would benefit greatly from doing a little bit more listening and a little less talking. Mm. We don't often hear a, a call for help from America. Either. I'm asking for it here. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Will we help Michael? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, a lot of your writing, to me, um, reads as, as a postcard to the future. Hmm. Um, uh, it, not just a warning, but, but almost a, um, a message. <laughs> hmm. uh, do you, do you, are you intending to, to write in that way? Well, you had said that to me backstage, hmm. and I was really taken aback by that. Hmm. Uh, I suppose, without me ever knowing it, I am... I am trying to reach, first of all, I think all writers want their work to be sustainable and lasting. I don't think you can create that. I think what you try to be is sincere and true in what you're doing and hope that it resonates down the line. I think what, after I heard you say that and hearing it again, mm. I think I'm in a funny way trying to create a record as we move along of one citizen of America, of the world, moving through that world and observing the good and the bad, mm. how we got to some of these places, and perhaps looking back from time to time saying, before we can go forward sometimes, please let's look back again. We should be doing that right now with the troops mm. going, to, going to Iraq. It doesn't mean you don't go to Iraq. It means you exhale, you take a pause, you look back, and you try to assess where you've come from before you continue to move forward. Mm. I, I think that's what I may be doing. Mm. But this is a long-term view you're talking about, Michael. That doesn't, that doesn't last the political cycle. <laughs> well, I'm not a politician. <laughs> Thank goodness. Yes. <laughs> or maybe we need you yeah. up there, Oh, no, 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 you don't. <laughs> Vote one, <laughs> no, Katakis. <laughs> it would be a disaster of biblical proportion. <laughs> Uh, in in Traveller Again, you write, uh, the tools of a traveller are a compass and a map. So what about the tools for a human? How do we navigate this world where everything is for sale? Don't be for sale. <laughs> uh, try to, you know, this was covered a long time ago, wasn't it? If we're to believe Plato, Socrates said that uh, the unexamined life is not worth living. Know thyself. I think those same things, the same impetus applies today. Know thyself. Uh, 
Examine your life. Examine what you think and what you believe because today the world is so interconnected. The way you behave when you go vote isn't just your vote. It's, the, it's also tr dealing with lots of people's futures. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that something so grave would be worthy of you spending a little time thinking about it. Uh, you may come to the same conclusion you have, but you will have thought about it. And so I suppose a little bit of restraint mm. and looking at ourselves truthfully and then trying to proceed and live the best lives that we can because we're here for a profoundly short time. Mm. It moves very quickly. Mm. And so I would rather leave this world where the measurement of what I thought was important was not measured by a handful of silver. Mm. That, it, that's a, that's a, a taking back and a, a thinking about things seriously, but it's also putting in a bit of effort, perhaps. Oh, yes. Um, the complicity that you describe um, of the USA today, I, I think that that could be, that could be seen in, in many countries, including Australia. Well, uh, you know, America can't have it both ways. It says it is the, the most, uh, the wealthiest nation in the world. It's one of the largest debtor nations in the world. It, it says that it loves its children, but we shoot children in Newtown, Connecticut, and we can't even have a nuanced discussion about keep your guns, but can't we have clips that have less bullets so when another madman comes, he can only shoot 20 children instead of 90 or 100. Mm -hmm. We can't even have a nuanced discussion, and when you can't have a nuanced, nuanced discussion, that means people have ceased to be critical thinkers. It's, a, it's, a, it's as if they've come to the end of knowledge with their implacable ideologies. I know what is correct, we should have that in place, when really what they're saying is, this is where my interests lie, mm -hmm. and I don't wish to explore or go forward or have them change. And that is a terrible position to be in. Mm -hmm. And I think America is more extreme in this than the other Western industrialized countries. Uh, healthcare is a perfect example. Everyone here saw, I'm sure on the television, people actually arguing against their own self-interest about health insurance, uh, who were working people who were being exploited by corporations and championed the corporation. Mm -hmm. This is a very strange thing. And so it suggests that people aren't thinking. Mm, mm. Your, um, your description, uh, your, your chapter, Dying the American Way in a Thousand Shards of Glass, is terrifying uh, and also very personal uh, about, about your experience with the American health care system. Yes, mm. yes. Well, it, was, it, it, uh, it shows uh, what what was happening to my dying wife mm. and how the system was treating her and us. And uh, it's quite brutal, but it's also true. Mm. Um, in the United States, I've said this before, we have decided that nothing but nothing should interfere with business in any way, even where life and death is concerned. And that is not my opinion, that is seen time and time again and be, can be quantified over and over and over again. So again, if you have such a philosophy, uh, then you wouldn't expect to have a healthcare system like France or like uh, Australia because the corporation's interests, above all, must be protected because it's jobs, they say it's jobs. But you know, I've often wondered when people say that because that's the mantra now, jobs, we need jobs. Well, actually we need jobs with living wages, but let's for a moment just say jobs, we need jobs. Um, I've often wondered, seeing that that's the mantra that's used all the time, if the Americans or the Australians were, were, were now saving one of the concentration camps in Germany, you know, and all the people were coming out 
and I, I have this vision. I had a bizarre dream once where we get there, the tanks are there, we save the concentration camp, we get the people out of there, and then German soldiers come from behind and go, what about the jobs, you know? What about the jobs? And I thought to myself, how bizarre, you know? We need the jobs, you know? And, and in a funny way, we do this in the United States. Jobs becomes this holy grail that anything should be allowed to be done because we get jobs from it. Well, the people who kept calling my home asking for my wife after she had had major brain surgery and couldn't do basic math, asking for more and more money each time after they had received hundreds of thousands of dollars, and still trying to talk to her when she couldn't communicate, uh, to the point where when she saw me so upset arguing once and me not knowing she was there, said, perhaps it's time for me to take my life now. Any system that pushes people to those points is not there to really help them. Mm. It's there to collect things from them. Mm. Mm. And it speaks volumes about who we are. It does. It's, it's, it's a chapter that um, I, I felt so frustrated and... and Sorry. And deeply, <laughs> and deeply hurt for you. It's oh, thank you. That's, yeah. very kind of, that's very kind of you to say. And one of, one of your friends in, in a conversation in the book compares the American health system to the mafia. <laughs> yes, the little, the little Italian fisherman when I was living in Italy, he was wonderful. He said, Michael, he said, why? Why 45 million people and no health insurance? I said, well, Giuseppe, it's, it's complicated. I'm not quite sure. He said, I think he's a mafia, he said. <laughs> And I said, Giuseppe, it's a lot of things, but I don't think it's a mafia. He said, no, no, no Michael, he's a, he's a mafia. I said, Giuseppe, please, it's not mafia. He said, oh, scuse, scuse, in your country you call them insurance companies. <laughs> and I said, Giuseppe, I think you're on to something. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> we have a lot to learn from Giuseppe. Yeah, I do indeed. I still do, yes. Um, as one of... Hemingway's representatives. Uh, what do you think that Hemingway would feel about America today? Well, that's interesting, isn't it? I, I don't, you know, I, I, I'm very reluctant to speak for what I think he would think. I, I will just fall back on Ernest Hemingway lived the majority of his life outside of the United States. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that was any, uh, for any particular political reason of any kind. I think that Ernest Hemingway loved Italy, and he loved Spain, and he loved Paris, and uh, I don't think he had knacks to grind. I think when he was in Cuba, um, you know, after being in the Spanish Civil War, uh, people thought he was crazy. He said the FBI were following him everywhere, J. Edgar Hoover, and people dismissed it, even his friends. Well, it turns out the FBI was following him all the time and had quite a big dossier on him. And so, uh, you know, I'm sure that came as a surprise to him. You know, geez, I'm a writer, for God's sake, you know. But I think Ernest Hemingway, um, you know, what would I say if he was alive today? I think he would probably be a little bored with America. I think it wouldn't be maybe as exciting for him as he would be. Where he would be now, I don't, I don't know. But in the time that he lived, he loved, he was certainly someone who occupied his life, inhabited his life, the fishing, the eating, the drinking, the writing. He had such a zest for life. You know, and when you look at pictures of him as a young man, stunningly handsome, mm -hmm. when you see pictures of him as an older man right before he passes away, he looks like a man much older than 60, 61 years mm -hmm. old. Where did that cheeky smile uh, go? Yes, and mm -hmm. this was living very hard and living fast and creatively and... Uh, and traveling, when you see how he moved through the world with no jet planes and none of the, he was covering a lot of ground. And uh, I think he, I think he loved the life he was living, mm. you know, for a time, mm. for a time. Mm. And today, I think he'd be looking for that same kind of life. Mm. I don't think America would have that. Mm. 
I could keep asking you questions all day, <laughs> but I won't hog you, as, as we say. I'm sure that a lot of people have questions out here, so we'll okay. take it to the audience. Hi. Hello. I understand uh, why the right uh, doesn't like you, but uh, I'm not, uh, I don't understand the fact. Why aren't you liked by the left? Well, I'm not sure I'm not liked by the left. I, I suspect I'm ignored by the left. I'm not that prominent. I'm not that... I, I think because I find difficulty with the left, the people who've betrayed a lot in the United States too, uh, by their lack of courage, have been our liberals. I know liberal is different here, but our liberals in the United States have given up a great deal and not fought for the things. They've tried to be like Tony Blair, neither fish nor fowl, new labor, whatever the heck that means. Finally, you stand up for what you are, and you stand up with some core principles and ethics of what you think is correct and stop trying to strategize what you think a certain part of the constituency wants to hear. We can see in the United States what that's brought us. That's brought us to a standstill with basically a decent man who's president who's trying to do some things but has been hamstrung. And they said from the very beginning, our goal is, which I find a very interesting governmental philosophy, our job is to make sure this president fails. Well, that's an interesting comment. I thought he was their president too. And I thought that negotiation between the two could make for a better life in the United States for not just business people or corporations, but for all of the citizens, especially those a little more vulnerable who will not have the best of lives, but at least we can ensure their children have an education, a chance at health care, and a chance to go as far as their talents will allow them. I, I hope that answers the question. Uh, Michael, look, my opinion, I assure you, Australia is galloping down the path of America becoming a shop. I'm sorry, I can't see you. Can I see where you are? Ah, excuse so, me. So, when did America turn from being a country into a store, and why? <clears throat> well, if you read Gore Vidal, he believes it happened after World War II when Truman put together the CIA and created what he called a national security state. I have a different view. Um, I think after World War II, we have evidence to show that with heavy regulation, fair taxes across the board, we had massive amounts of manufacturing and the widest expansion of wealth in the history of mankind across socioeconomic groups. Now, I have to tell you, that's quite an achievement. We had a burgeoning middle class, and we were churning along. We still had a lot of things to learn in terms of equal rights and of civil rights, but we were moving along. And then, we find ourselves in the 70s, 80s, Mr. Reagan uh, believed in this trickle-down theory, believed in these different kind of economic uh, methods, which, by the way, George Bush Sr. had called voodoo economics uh, when he ran against Reagan. And what you have now is a, a middle class that's evaporating before our very eyes wage stagnation, the rich becoming beyond belief, beyond the robber barons of the past. And unions are basically broken, but it doesn't stop the right from still vilifying unions and they're the problem. They're against collective bargaining. They're even working at making it harder for black people and people of color to vote again. After, so we're kind of going backwards. And yet, when I ask some of my conservative friends, and I do have conservative friends, when I ask them, I know this is good for some people who are benefiting from this, but can you please explain to me how it is good for the country as a whole, not only economically, but psychologically? What I, the responses I've gotten from my dear conservative friends is, that's a liberal question. <laughs> and so I'm not concerned if it's a liberal question or a conservative question. I'm, it is a question. And if someone can't answer that question, I become very suspicious as the old journalist of why you're not answering that question. Because clearly we have two models. One that worked for basically all of the citizens, not everyone, but most. 
and widen the middle class. The other is destroying it. And by the way, if you have no middle class, you have no representative republic. If you have no redress as things are being corporatized, public policy, public assets, if you have no redress, you have no rights. How do I vote out the person like in Carmel, California now, who's the head of the corporation, who controls water in that part of California? I can't go to the ballot box and vote him out. How do I do it now? How do I not get abused? So that's, I, I hope I've answered the question. I suspect I've gone a little too far <laughs> with it. So. Thanks, Mike. I am tempted to uh, follow up on the American politics question as a fellow American now living out in the world, but um, Hello. Uh, I, I actually want to ask if you're at liberty to share any of the uh, Hemingway stories that you've acquired along the way that, that maybe we haven't heard. Uh, you mean a personal Hemingway story? Yes. Yes, I'm happy to do that for you because there's one story that I love so that Patrick told me that I love that gives you a different picture of Ernest Hemingway. Uh, Patrick told me this, and I love it so, uh, that uh, when the boys were younger, the three boys, the three sons, they would be with their father in Cuba. And um, they were swearing a lot, Ernest Hemingway found. They were running around, and they were swearing. They were just swearing all the time, you know. And uh, Ernest Hemingway called them in and said, now look, boys, I hear you swearing all the time, using bad language out in the field, so you have to pick a time when uh, for half an hour every day will be your swear time. So you pick the time. And they all have a discussion. I guess they came up with like 2 o'clock in the afternoon or something like that till 2.30 would be their swear time. And, Pat, uh, and Ernest said, all right. Now, the following day or sometime during that week, a telegram comes in from uh, Hollywood, from Leland Hayward or someone. And it says, uh, dear Mr. Hemingway, uh, Short, happy life of Francis Macomber, too big for the marquee. Any suggestions? And Hemingway got so upset, he jumps up and he goes, how about fuck? <laughs> and the boys come running in and go, father, it's not two o'clock yet. <laughs> and so uh, I can imagine they had a lot of fun together. <laughs> That's what I think. Thank you, really interesting. Um, I've read a lot of Hemingway biographies. Could you yeah. point me in the direction of one that you consider the definitive or the one that maybe gets closer to him, the man, not just the writer? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I wish I could. Uh, the, the biographies for me, almost all of them that I've read, are a bit sensational and they try to find out something about being gay or doing this. I, I think the one I would probably go to to start off with is Carlos Baker's old, older one that was less dramatic. Uh, but then I'd also read A Movable Feast and you let Hemingway create his own fictional memoir of sorts. If I read all of those, where could I go now for, for something that might be um, a little less known or a little less, you know? Well, you know, there's a book that Patrick loves, and I love it too. It's called The True Gen by Brian Cox. And uh, I think it's Mr. Cox, Brian Cox. And why I think that book is wonderful and why I think Patrick thinks that book is wonderful is because Mr. Cox let the people who knew Ernest Hemingway speak to him, and he kept quiet, while Archibald McLeish and others spoke to him about their recollections and their friendship or their dislikes of Ernest Hemingway. And it gives a good picture. The other thing that I would suggest is the new editions of Ernest Hemingway's letters that are coming out from Cambridge University, uh, Cambridge University Press. Two volumes are out now, a third is about to come out. We've worked very hard on them uh, to gather all the letters from around the world that are still coming in. And you get to hear him in his own voice is a wonderful voice to a lot of different people, Marlena, Dietrich, everyone. Um, it gives you a picture of the man, I think, and what people thought of him. I hope that helps. We probably have time for one more question. Hi, I read Hi. a um, little anecdote some years ago, <coughs> excuse me, about the, um, the state of the Hemingway house in Cuba. I, my understanding is he was in USA 
when he died and his house and estate in Cuba was left untouched. Is that story true? And if so, what's happened in more recent years? Well, Mary left the house and its belongings to the Cuban people. Um, I was at the house a few years ago and the Cuban government opened it for me and I went through and it's as if Hemingway just stepped outside for a moment. Uh, papers left on the ottoman that he was reading or on his bed. His typewriter on the little stand where he stood and wrote. And it really did have the feeling that he had just, just stepped out or he was swimming by the pool. Uh, the Cuban government has really done all they, they have been able to do to really keep that uh, very special. And uh, Ernest Hemingway left his wonderful boat, the Pilar, to his captain, Gregorio Fuentes, who then turned it over to the Cuban government. The boat, I, I stood on it. It's in the back of the house, the Finca Vigia. The Cuban government uh, got an Italian architect, I believe it was, to do an incredible covering of it in the back of the house. And they have, they have so admired him for so long and he had such a love of that place uh, that I think it's stunning, quite frankly. Even during the embargo, the difficulties they've had, um, they've done a beautiful job, as good as they could do. We do have time for one more short one. I'll just add Hemingway's house, which you, you can visit it. They, they don't let you inside. You no, they don't. The outside. But you can look in the windows and you can see everything through the windows. Yeah. Although earlier this year I was there and unfortunately the, the whole estate was closed off uh, making a film or something. Hmm. It, I didn't know what the, what the story on that was. No, nor do I. Hmm. Well, thank you all so much for coming along today. Uh, thank you to the wonderful Wheeler Centre and Simon and Schuster for being for bringing along such a brilliant thinker oh. and writer. And <laughs> thank Michael, you. thank you for spending it's time a, with us. It's my great pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. It's very kind of you.